Will the Pakistan school shooting galvanize the nuclear power against extremism? As oil prices fall, how will global economies change? And a roundup of YouTube's most viewed music videos of 2014. Africa 54 starts right now. Hello and welcome, I'm Vincent McCory. This is Africa 54. International condemnation has poured into Pakistan following the horrific Taliban attack on a military-run school in Peshawar that killed 132 children. The country has announced three days of mourning and the leadership, both political and military, promised retribution. VOS Aisha Tanzim looks at how lately the likely the Pakistani government is to clamp down on all extremist groups. Chaos, desperation, anger. <laughs> Scenes of injured children, desperate parents and coffins being carried away. And promises of retaliation by Pakistan's powerful military. <laughs> All these terrorists and their sympathizers, their facilitators, their abettors, anyone who's given them sanctuary anywhere in the country, we will go after them as well. Strong words, but will the government follow through? The Pakistani army's sworn enemy, Tehreek e Taliban Pakistan, or TTP, has claimed responsibility for the attack. But Pakistan has many extremist groups on its soil. Some have been the government's strategic allies for several decades. U.S. officials say groups like lashkar e taiba are primarily used against India, while others like the Haqqani what? Network are used to safeguard Pakistani interests in Afghanistan. Pakistan watcher Lisa Curtis of the Washington-based Heritage Foundation says you cannot completely separate TTP from these groups. Their ideology is the same. They uh, cooperate, they train together, uh, they have overlapping memberships and they will rely on each other for logistical support. They'll share the same safe houses. Pakistan's army officially says it is carrying out an operation against all terrorist groups. But analysts believe elements in the country's army and intelligence apparatus are divided. And some of those elements still think they can separate enemies like the TTP from friends like lashkar e -Taiba. Then there's a question of capacity. Marvin Weinbaum of the Middle East Institute in Washington thinks it is unlikely that Pakistan will mount a full-scale offensive against all extremist groups. Because they still are fearful that these groups will somehow unite and also create greater problems for Pakistan, not just in the frontier area, but in the Punjab as well. Adding to that equation is the increase in tensions with Pakistan's arch-rival and neighbor to the east. Pakistan and India have been regularly trading fire across the disputed line of control in Kashmir. The military now would be loath to take the, get these people out of business because it may have to depend on them, depending on what happens with India. Weinbaum says all these other problems are surmountable if the country realizes that its biggest challenge is not the TTP, it's extremism itself. Independent analysts think Pakistan has seen a disturbing growth in extremist ideology, permeating all segments of society. Until that is tackled through a multi-pronged strategy, going after one group may not be enough. Aisha Tanseem, VOA News, Washington. Well, in West Africa, Boko Haram militants have been terrorizing Nigeria since 2009. The victims have been many. Over 5,000 have been killed by attacks and bomb blasts, according to Human Rights Watch. The problem has attracted global attention and concern about the economic impact and consequences to neighboring countries on the world. Uh, this problem was discussed at the Peace Game event. Our visiting reporter, Ine Thompson of Channels TV, has the details. The stability and development of any one country is not just the concern of that country, but of the world. The Peace Game is a program of the United States Institute of Peace. For 2014, the focus is on Nigeria, the activities of Boko Haram, the root of the problem and possible solution. 
Understanding the northern region of Nigeria by providing analysis, education and resources to those working for peace is what has brought diplomats, non-governmental organizations, academia and interested business organizations here. The approach is to hear all sides, so the northern Nigeria government, local Nigerian business interests, international NGOs and even the dreaded Boko Haram group had representation. With this, it's expected that the true picture of what has birthed and sustained a terrorist group will be understood and the seeming elusive solution found. Frankly, trying to wipe out corruption in general is not the way you want to do it. What you want to do, it seems to me, is create incentives for political leaders to do good projects. And there's going to be some corruption. Considerations also included the economic threats to neighboring countries where some Nigerians in the north are displaced too. And what we haven't talked about is the economic crunch that's coming to marginalized and vulnerable populations now. People who need economic opportunities and programs now, not even a crop cycle away. These perspectives are well appreciated by Nigerians represented at the conference. But speaking as insiders, they would prefer more assistance in immediate survival of the communities. We also expected them uh, to also devote uh, equal or more time on the immediate uh, uh, measures that needs to be taken, particularly on the security side, uh, how the U.S. can assist us uh, in uh, uh, strengthening our military, strengthening uh, our security agencies uh, uh, in order to assist us to, to combat uh, this insurgency. I'm still shocked that the voice of the communities, the rural people, whom are being chased away from their village by Boko Haram, their voice is not being heard in all the discussion here. While the United States Institute of Peace listens to these other perspectives, the next agenda is, however, the implementation of the strategies already discussed here, working with organizations that operate in northern Nigeria. Ini Thompson reporting for VOA News, Washington, D.C. A rescue operation is ongoing in Kenya, where a four-story building collapsed in Nairobi early on Wednesday. Kenya's Red Cross and other emergency services are helping with the rescue operation, pulling at least seven survivors from the scene and taking them to hospital. Many more are still believed to be trapped under the rubble. Uh, Kenya's thriving economy has fueled a building boom, especially in major cities. But the speed of construction has always raised concerns about standards. The collapsed building stood next to a construction site where ex excavation for the foundations had filled with water. So far, there is no word on the cause of the collapse. While Sierra Leone is intensifying its Ebola response as infection rates rise, on Wednesday, health workers started searching door to door for Ebola patients and anyone with whom they have recently had contact. Anyone found to be infected with the virus will be transported to new British built Ebola treatment centers. 50% of the 18,000 confirmed cases of the deadly virus are in Sierra Leone. Speaking in Sierra Leone Wednesday, Dr. Tom Frieden, the director of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, says the measures that the country is undertaking now are expected to lead to a significant decrease in cases within several weeks. Now calls for reform and increased scrutiny of police tactics have resurfaced in the United States after the fatal shooting of an unarmed African-American teenager by a white police officer. VOS Chris Simpkins has the details. The fatal shooting of Michael Brown by Ferguson police officer Darren Wilson was not an isolated event in American policing, according to FBI statistics. While records are considered incomplete, the Federal Bureau of Investigation says between 2005 and 2012, an average of at least two black people a week were killed by white police officers in the United States. Shots fired. Male down, um, black male, maybe 20. The most recent accounts of what are termed justifiable homicides compiled by police suggest black teenagers are 21 times more likely to be killed by police than white teenagers. Civil rights activist Martin Luther King III. Uh, and there are several incidents where police are consistently, it, it feels, to communities of color, shooting them. So the, the question is, how do, how do we address this as a society? And I think this is the pent-up frustration. What do we want? Justice! Where do we want it? Now! 
Brown's killing and other recent high-profile cases involving white officers shooting unarmed African Americans has inflamed racial tensions and sparked demonstrations demanding reforms. President Obama established a commission to study issues in policing, including proposed programs to equip more officers with body cameras. Frustrations that we've seen are not just about a particular incident. They have deep roots in many communities of color uh, who have a sense that our laws are not always being enforced uniformly or fairly. The U.S. Justice Department has launched a program to work with local authorities to train officers on the use of force, bias reduction, and procedural fairness. Attorney General Eric Holder. And although these issues are, as I said, complex and the problems longstanding, we have seen in city after city where we have engaged that meaningful change is possible. Some black leaders want more minority officers patrolling in African American communities. But National Association of Police Organizations Executive Director Bill Johnson does not favor so-called race-based policing. If you go too far, there's a risk then of, of saying, I want, you know, Officer Jones in this community because he or she Officer Jones is the same color as the people who live here. And at, at that point, you really are um, making decisions based on people's color, and I think that's wrong. U.S. Justice Department officials are conducting more than 20 uh, investigations into police departments, including in Ferguson, Missouri, to see whether there are patterns of using excessive and deadly force in minority communities. Chris Simpkins, VOA News, Washington. U.S. authorities are downplaying a shadowy hacker group threat to attack theaters that show a comedy about a plot to assassinate North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Now, the so-called Guardians of Peace on Tuesday released a statement promising a bitter fate to those who see the film The Interview, which is set to be released nationwide on Christmas Day. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security says it is analyzing the message, but insisted there is no credible intelligence to indicate an active plot against movie theaters. Uh, the, th the threats by the Guardians of Peace followed the release of thousands of private emails the group obtained from Sony Pictures. Uh, the nature of the emails, many of which contained insulting remarks about celebrities, uh, prompted apologies from company executives. Well, we want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Coming up, how falling oil prices are reshaping global economy, economics. rather. Stay with us. Shaka Sali, host and senior editor of VOA's international calling talk show, Straight Talk Africa. Today we'll examine the tobacco industry. We pretty much touch on anything that you can think of. Politics, health issues, human rights issues, you name it, we talk about it. The issues that we discuss are pertinent to most people on the African continent. A very, very rare and unique opportunity to interact with their leaders. Welcome back. Now, falling oil prices are changing the economic and strategic balance between oil exporters and their customers. Analysts call the process a major gamble for Saudi Arabia, Iran, the United States, and other major petroleum producers. VOA's Jim Randall reports. U.S. gasoline prices are at the lowest level in years thanks to falling crude oil prices. Crude prices plunged because slowing economies in Europe and Asia reduced demand for energy just as surging crude production in the United States increased the oil supply. Too much crude and too little demand complicate the economic and energy landscape for energy producers, according to Elise consulting investment expert James Berkeley, who spoke via Skype. You can clearly see that uh, some of the, um, you know, some of the uh, producers are, are playing a, a, a game of poker. In the past, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries coped with falling prices by agreeing to cut production, which limited supplies and boosted prices. But this time, OPEC members did not agree on a deal. 
key OPEC member Saudi Arabia can produce oil cheaply and has significant financial reserves. The Saudis may calculate their country can endure low oil prices longer than their economically troubled regional rival Iran, according to LaSalle University professor Edward Terzansky, who spoke via Skype. The Saudis say, we'll be willing to pay a price for some trouble at home because we know it's going to hit the Iranians much harder. But low oil prices are also hurting the oil-dependent economies of Venezuela and Russia. Analysts say leaders in Moscow and Caracas have made promises to their people based on budgets that assume far more oil revenue than they're getting now. That may force them to make unpopular choices on where to spend the remaining revenue, possibly weakening their political power. Low oil prices also hurt the profits of U.S. oil producers. But the head of the American Petroleum Institute, Jack Girard, says they will be saved by innovations and growing efficiency in U.S. oil fields adding that surging U.S. oil production is boosting U.S. power. It's changing in a very significant way as the U.S. now wrests control from Russia, from the Middle East and elsewhere as the world's dominant power in oil and natural gas. Berkeley says growing U.S. oil production is changing the geopolitical landscape. I think that that's a really, um, that is playing out to be the biggest uh, uh, geopolitical um, and economic uh, issue of this next three to five years. Berkeley says it's a safe bet that the struggle over oil prices, energy production, and economic growth will grow more and more intense. Jim Randall, VOA News, Washington. Well, for more insight into the implications of the drop in global oil prices in African economies, I'm joined by Eugenia Mbal, an economic analyst and author of the book, Creating Prosperity in Africa. Mr. Nyambal, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you. Now, Thank listening you. to our story just before um, uh, that just aired, you get the sense that uh, this is more of a rivalry among nations, oil producing nations, rather than uh, economic forces kind of uh, setting the price. Or what are we to understand in a few words? I think it, uh, it's both. Uh, the first one is geopolitical battle between uh, Saudi Arabia and its Gulf allies and um, other consumers and producers. Uh, we need to, to bear in mind that Saudi Arabia has a production cost that is lower than its partners. It also have huge um, reserves at the central bank, about $9 billion. So to f they, they're doing it for two reasons. The first one is against Iran mm -hmm. and Russia for their involvement in, in Syria. And the second one is to make sure that the growing U.S. oil producers do not have room to grow. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go to the African continent, uh, you know, someone on the streets of Nairobi will be delighted to see the prices going down. I am certainly delighted to see the price going down per gallon. What is the benefit for those who consume and how does it impact those who produce in Africa, like Nigeria and Angola? Well, uh, overall in Africa, you have two groups of countries. You have the winners and losers. Winners are um, countries of uh, East Africa and Southern Africa that are non-oil producers. Uh, you take the case of um, Kenya. Kenya will benefit um, from low uh, oil prices uh, in the tourism sector because of lower transportation costs. In uh, agribusiness, because they will be able to ship uh, goes to Europe and other uh, locations, and also the average consumer can benefit, provided that the government adjust the prices downward. So they'll have a little more money to yeah. inject into the economy, into the economy. By, through purchases of into other things. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and also in countries like South Africa, they will also benefit in the mining industry and in manufacturing because. Mining is um, oil, great oil-consuming industry. Yes. So South Africa will be well off. 
Now, the problem, the losers <laughs> yeah. are in uh, West Africa and yeah. Central Africa. Take the example of uh, Nigeria. In Nigeria, about 75% of government income comes yeah. from the oil sector. Wow. The economy is not well diversified. So they will incur um, budget cuts and they will have to restructure the economy. You have other countries like uh, Angola, Gabon, Equatorial Guinea. These countries were making good inroads into you know, building new infrastructure, uh, moving forward with the economic development plan. Right. But now, yeah. To slow down. Yeah, but they, they, very, will, they will slow down. Yeah, one question here. Some people will say, well, countries like Angola, Nigeria, could actually perhaps produce a little more and sell to the United States, for example, and forget about Saudi Arabia. Can that create the balance? Create Angola, Nigeria, selling to the U.S., rather than the U.S. wondering about what Saudi Arabia is doing with their oil? Well, what we have right now is that the U.S. has become the number one oil producer in the world. So they have enough spare supply. Mm -hmm. So in the long run, Nigeria and Angola will need to find other customers. They, no. will, need, yeah, they, will, they will need to find other markets. The U.S. is not going to be their market. Do you, the U.S. in the long run will no longer be the key market of, of these countries. Because the U.S. oil industry is growing. Yeah. Uh, they're not exporting yet but they will become a big player in the industry. Well, uh, Eugene, thank you very much for your insights. Thank you. All right. Uh, Eugene Yambal is an economic analyst and author of the book, Creating Prosperity in Africa. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54. YouTube Stop Trending Music Videos of 2014. We'll be right back. If you've just joined us, I'm Mariama Diallo, and here is a quick recap of today's headlines. The presidents of Chad, Mali, and Senegal call for a push against jihadists. In Rwanda, genocide tribunal closes after two decades of work. And about 1,000 ex-fighters from a former DRC rebel group M23 break out of a camp in Uganda. And Tunisians prepare for the second round in country's presidential election on Sunday. Finally, in Ivory Coast, President Alassane Ouattara inaugurates the first toll bridge in the economic capital Abidjan. This is designed to ease heavy traffic. That's it for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Welcome back to Africa 54. YouTube has crowned its hottest artists for 2014, and the results won't surprise you. Let's rage! Well, the internet fell in love with Katy Perry's Dark Horse featuring Juicy J. The video earned the top uh, spot on the list of most watched videos from the past year. Uh, the site tallied the number of, of times the video was viewed from day, the day it was uploaded through November 30th. Dark Horse won by a landslide garnering over 717 million views since it was uploaded on February the 20th. Well, coming in at number two for 2014. Yo te miro y se me corta la respiración Cuando tú me miras se me sube el corazón Katy Perry's closest competitor was pop superstar Enrique Iglesias whose Spanish version of the song Bila Do, which means dancing, had people all over the world busting a move. Uh, Enrique's song has racked up over 600 million views and counting. And next up in YouTube's top videos of 2014.
where Shakira takes the third and fourth spot with I Can't Remember to Forget You, featuring Rihanna at over 443 million views, and La 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 featuring uh, Khalid Nours uh, Brown at over 419 million views. Uh, La 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 was an anthem for the World Cup this year in Brazil, the biggest sporting event in the world. It features some of the biggest uh, sports stars in the world, including Messi, Neymar, and Sergio Aguero. And that is what is trending today. Well, scientists in the United States, Europe, and elsewhere are experimenting with two types of fusion nuclear reactors that could someday provide cheap and abundant energy. And finally, win the world from fossil-based uh, fuels. Uh, viewers, George Putich tells us more. To be clear, nuclear fusion is not absolutely safe, but it is immensely safer than fission employed in today's nuclear power plants. A fusion reactor cannot explode, its fuel does not stay radioactive for long, and it can be an infinite source of energy, says University of Washington professor of physics Thomas Jarbo. It doesn't have any footprint uh, on the earth, no, no, no footprint, no, no long-lived radioactive waste, no greenhouse gases. Uh, it's basically the ideal energy source. But ignition of the fusion process requires creating and sustaining conditions similar to those on the sun's surface in a closed chamber. Once the fusion starts, it gives away huge amounts of heat, useful for creating steam and turning turbines of power generators. Scientists experiment with several methods of fusion ignition. One of them, called tokamak, currently under construction in France, will use huge superconducting magnets to keep the super-hot plasma in place. But Professor Jarbo and his team are trying a different approach, driving electrical currents into the plasma itself in order to create the strong magnetic field. What we've discovered here is a way to sustain the current much, much more efficiently, orders of magnitude more efficiently than conventional current drive methods that they use on tokamaks. Professor Jarbo says building a full-size reactor they call Dynamac would require a much smaller amount of material than tokamak reactor. That allows the reactor to be a, a lot cheaper because there's, there's less wall, walls to deal with and less coils to shield. Scientists plan to continue experimenting by building a larger Dynamac reactor that could sustain the plasma more efficiently and say they are confident that sustainable fusion will be reached within the generation. George Putich, VOA News, Washington. Well, and that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show Africa News tonight at 1800 UTC. And in the mornings, today break Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC, Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching. From all of us here in Washington, have a good night. able to touch on things that are important to people on an everyday basis. Hello and welcome, I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. In a lively half hour, news, sports, health, lifestyle information, comments from our viewers. Africa 54, the best for Africa about Africa. Join us only on VOA. I am Sheikh Asali, host and senior editor of VOA's international calling talk show, Straight Talk Africa. Today we'll examine the tobacco industry. We pretty much touch on anything that you can think of. Politics, his health issues, human rights issues, you name it, we talk about it. The issues that we discuss are pertinent to most people on the African continent. A very, very rare and unique opportunity to interact with their leaders.